introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kamafor Anyanvu, who is an associate professor of computer science at North Carolina State University's Department of Computer Science. She has been there since 2007. Her research contributions have focused on techniques for big data management in different application contexts, ranging from search on the web to blockchain applications. She has multiple papers with the best paper award, as well as award nominations. Her research is supported by multiple NSF grants, as well as industry funding, funding such as IBM faculty awards. Her students, both PhD and MS, have been well placed in industry and companies such as Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, eBay, Amazon, Amazon AWS, and so on. Thank you again, Dr. Uh, Kemofor, for accepting our uh, invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Amini. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I bring you greetings from North Carolina. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about, oh, just give me a second. I meant to turn my my timer on so that I could um, I could keep track of uh, reset. Okay, there we go. So, yes. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, um, you know the role of semantics in big data analytics because I think it is really at the heart of, of a lot of the problems that we have in big data, and of course a lot of the work that we do couldn't be possible without uh, students. So here are some of my students. I'd like to acknowledge them, and of course funding from places like NSF and so on. So the talk outline is, I'm going to talk about what the what and why of semantics and analy analytics, and then some of the challenges of, the, uh, of, of computing over semantic data models, um, the how, which is sort of how we've tried to deal with the problem and some emerging uh, new applications that we're looking at that also um, have semantic requirements. So let's begin with the Wikipedia definition of semantics. It's really a study of meaning, understanding, and it's the business of, many different disciplines, right? Philosophy, linguistics, and so on. In computer science, we, we focus, you know, our, uh, our view of semantics is really uh, uh, to associate meaning to language constructs, right? We deal with different kinds of languages, programming languages, data languages, and, you know, they all have syntactic forms, and we need to associate um, some kind of interpretation to the, to the syntactic constructs. Um, and typically this is done by providing rules that at least constrain the possible interpretations of what, what's been expressed. So let me start with just a simple example. This slide and the next slide is a borrowed slide from people do that, uh, doing work on deep learning. Um, and so this is on natural language, right? So obviously the, the syntactic form is, is um, governed by uh, the English grammar and so on. But um, they, they are studying, they were trying to build models for predicting, you know, looking at like social media content and so on, trying to see how to predict when somebody might be mentally decompensating, right? Are they really thinking, are they, are, are they a risk, right? So this is someone who's struggling with their sexuality and they've made some comments and they build models. And in this, uh, in this case, the model predicted depres depression, obviously you can see words like worthless and so on. And um, so, uh, first of all, it did identify that there's mentally health related, you know, and it is uh, depression. Um, the reason, uh, which is one of the limitations of some of these deep learning and connectionist models is, you know, you don't really get an explanation for what, for, for your predictions. But anyway, so the reason for this is not really clear, obviously you can guess. Um, now, there's, there was an alternative um, prediction, which is uh, the obsessive compulsive disorder. It did, it predicted that as false, right? There was very, very low probability for that one. It turns out that in reality, like if this person was actually facing a mental health expert, uh, the, the reverse would have been the case. The diagnosis would have actually been obsessive compulsive disorder because of the obsessive um, thoughts about, you know, I've forgotten what the phrasing was, but anyway. Um, so what these people have been doing, and, and you know, there are a couple of people who are looking at how to use semantics to achieve this, this new vision of AI explainability, right? How do we get these uh, deep learning models and machine learning models to explain what it is that they, how they've arrived at the, a, um, a, a, a prediction so that we can you know, follow the, its reasoning. And so what they did was um, they, they integrated the, the process, in the process they integrated a conceptual model. So this is like a knowledge base 
uh, the DSM-5 graph, which is a knowledge base about mental health concepts. So all the concepts, how they are related, you can see some of them were are able to be um, highlighted in this um, paragraph now, and then you know how they are related. And then based on this, um, in an, an, an integrating that into the modeling process, they were able to now, um, um, the prediction was now obsessive compulsive disorder. And furthermore, it, you are able to produce a reasoning, uh, a justification for why, why this, um, this prediction. So, uh, like I said, these are, these, are, these are some of the trends in terms of using semantics to improve explainability. But you see um, here one example. Now, that's an example uh, in, the, in the context of natural language text, right, and doing predictive tasks. Uh, but, you know, the lay of the land is really broader, right? So there, first of all, there are different kinds of analytics tasks. You could be doing a descriptive analytics task or predictive like we just saw or prescriptive. And there's even a fourth one, which I don't remember now. And also the data could be very, uh, could be varied, right? It could be um, different, there are different kinds of data. It could vary in terms of syntax, structure and semantics. And we're, and we're gonna talk a lot more about semantics today. So let me give another example. Um, so here is, um, imagine a policy uh, public health analyst trying to give some advice to to um, to policymakers about you know investments uh, that they should be making in um, in public in you know at least medical research right they're trying to understand the investments that have been made so far in biomedical research and I think NIH and all of that is that really translating into a global a reduced global disease burden. Right? Are we getting fewer deaths, fewer deaths for certain diseases, whatever diseases we're researching? So, uh, so to be able to do that, obviously there isn't one place to find this answer. There are a number of different places. I've put down some things here that, that such an analyst might want to consider. There's the WHO Global Health Observatory, which has a number of uh, data sets talking about deaths and diseases and by gender and you know all kinds of things. Um, it keeps that the WHO keeps track of there things from uh, pharmaceutical companies when they are doing clinical trials. So let's say they're studying, they're developing a drug for a particular illness, or a particular disease, um, and it goes into clinical trials. Uh, you know, there, there are lots of uh, reports and so on that go into that. Uh, that's an indication of investment in, uh, in uh, you know, disease um, treatment. And then there are various things that you could find that maybe in medical journals like the JMA, uh, JEMA, um, you could find people who've been who are studying sort of the disease burden. You can study find out people who are doing medical research on the disease and so on. So there are different kinds of potential sources of information that uh, such an analyst might want to use. And you know, it's important to note that these are uh, data. These this this is a, these are different collections curated by different agencies. They're not like all in one warehouse, and they couldn't possibly be. And you have really no control over the way data is structured, what terms are used, and so on. You just have to find a way to use as is. And so uh, it's possible that some of the different of the different applications will use different terminology, like maybe here we'll say ductal carcinoma, uh, whereas maybe in the global health observatory, it uses term cancer, breast cancer, you know, what are the differences, how are these things related? So to be able to even aggregate all of this in any meaningful way, we need to reconcile some of these different th these differences, not just the structure, but the terminologies. And to be able to do the terminologies, you need, for example, I need to know that um, ductal carcinoma is a type of breast cancer, right? I need information about diseases. Uh, some of these studies may have had a geographical context. Maybe they were done in a city or in a country. And the context might be different. But if we know that maybe a state is part of a country, then we know how to reason about how to combine all this information. So we need geographic information. And we probably need many other things. I just wanted to point out some of the things that we will need to be able to link up, create these links. Now, like I said, there'll be uh, differences in both syntax and structure. So some may be spreadsheets, some may be relational databases, some may be uh, PDF documents, you know. So the syntax and structure, uh, the heterogeneity in syntax and structure is a little bit easier to manage. If, you're, if you know what the structure is, you can sort of build maybe wrapper technologies or something to do that. The challenge is semantic heterogeneity because this is related to content and content is very ad hoc, hard to anticipate all of the content ahead of time. So you have to build ways that, um, you have to build techniques that allow you to sort of automatically uh, link, up how, link up terms um, across your different data sources where possible. 
And, you know, so semantic heterogeneity can occur even within the same type of data. So here I have, this is actually a true use case. This is um, in Massachusetts. The two, you know, two hospitals, I think Brigham Young is the, is the women's hospital and then the Mass General, right? So both have these databases, obviously. And one of them, uh, both of them actually happen to have tables that have a column prescription, or prescriptions or whatever, right? Now, it turns out that they don't exactly mean the same thing, right? So in one hospital, uh, the, the column prescription means that the prescription that the patient is taking at the time of that particular encounter. Um, whereas in the other hospital, it means all known prescriptions taken by the by patient. Obviously, the domain is the same. We're talking about drugs. However, the temporal contexts are different. And so when you're trying to merge this data, you have to be aware because it might matter for some analytical results. So, so what do I mean by these linking? I have, I'm here, I'm showing here now a slightly, um, well, an example of what we might do for the public health example, something, this is an example that's similar to that one. So first of obviously you want to identify, I, in my previous, let me just flip back, in the previous uh, here, I talked about maybe getting some information about diseases, getting some information about countries, and you know whatever extra information you think you might need. And so this is an attempt, uh, this is from a paper. Uh, so here there is some vocabulary around um, uh, clinical trials. So if you go to clini uh, clinicaltrials.gov or something, they have all of the um, terms associated with clinical trials. Uh, of course, put down in an informal sense, but we'll show how to formalize some of these concepts. How do you actually define them so that they're machine processable? That's really the focus of the uh, rest of the talk. And so, so anyway, you have things about clinical trials and that's one data set. So here you can talk about disease conditions. You can talk about secondary outcomes, things like that. Uh, you have the UMLS, which is the medical, vocab uh, medical disease vocabulary or medical terms or whatever vocabulary. And there you, it talks about sort of diseases and so on. Uh, you have other kinds of um, vocabularies that would be useful. But what is interesting is that, and then, oh yeah, here you have um, a PubMed. So this is like a hodgepodge of a whole bunch of bio, bio data set, protein, genes, you know, pathways, all kinds of things. And then uh, we want to link them to diseases and link them to, you know, locations, a concept that may have it, uh, depending what type of concept it, it is the geographical location and so on. So basically once you have terms defined from different, the different contexts that you want, geographical, clinical trials, and, uh, diseases and so on, then you can start to uh, link up data, link, link up uh, uh, terms in your different data sources. Doesn't matter whether it's a spreadsheet, doesn't matter whether it's a, it's, um, it's a you know, relational database or text, right? Um, you just start to attach a markup, uh, which is really what it, how it's done in practical terms, but uh, graphically, this is what it would look like. So you can say something like one term here is the same as another term. Now we're going to talk about what do I mean by same as and how, you know, this is right now looks like a string, but we, we want these, um, these um, edges defined, formally defined in a way that a user, that the machine can reason about it, not just a string labels. So we're going to talk about how to define formally define these nodes, these concepts, and the edges, the labeled edges that um, uh, that we need to link up um, our information. Here's just another example uh, showing how we can, you know, using things like um, linking um, medical data to things like the, uh, some results and so on. Now, this this idea before we get into the, the the bulk of it, this idea of trying to use formal concepts and, and relationships to link up things has really, really taken on quite, um, you know, since maybe about, about maybe 10 years now. Um, what you're seeing here are different, each of these circles by themselves is a, uh, shall we say domain, right? Um, so here you have, for example, or maybe a particular data collection, let's put it that way. So for example, you have the CIA World Factbook is one of these circles. So here you have all the information that's typically in the World Factbook represented using formal concepts and, and relationships. Same things with the geo names and uh, which is about you know geographic locations, things like that. You will see stuff to do with genes. You will see stuff to do with uh, entertainment, movies, all kinds of different things. So each of these circles and they're color coded just to say you know some of them fall within the domain maybe bio. Or, 
or government and so on and so forth. That's what the colors mean. But you know, that's an old picture, but I, I like the way that it zoomed into this, uh, this section so that you could sort of see what was going on. In the center here, you have Dipipedia, which is Wikipedia in this form that we're talking about. So taking the content of Wikipedia and sort of trying to make it um, more machine processable as opposed to just being text, okay? So this is closer to what it looks like now. So the, the point is it continues to grow. More and more people are adding, are transforming their data sets, uh, just like somebody took the clinicaltrials.gov collection and converted it to this uh, model. And then now we can, other people can reuse that and point to, point to the concepts there and so on. Uh, so this graph continues to grow and you can see the different uh, you know, uh, colors, what they mean and so on. So it's getting more and more uh, popular, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Now, so if you, once you have this done, um, what you would then do is you'd be able to, um, you'd be able to write, let's say a query, let's say uh, if it's a descriptive analytics task, you're trying to find a number of deaths uh, and a number of clinical trials for tobacco, tobacco, TB and HIV in all countries. So that's, uh, you have a pattern that you're trying to find. So pattern is not, um, people with, TB and HIV and so on, you know, have, that's part of the, def, uh, the pattern that you're trying to map, like a where clause in your select, in your, in your SQL. And then you have a grouping and aggregation, which means, you know, group country and so on and count. So that's your typical sort of descriptive analytics task. We don't worry too much about this syntax here, because this is a syntax for querying if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your data looks like the graph that we talked about, but I'll show you a little bit more of an example. But the important thing to see here is that these, uh, um, each of these things are like the labels and the nodes, uh, the labels that we saw, and you have these prefixes, and these prefixes sort of, uh, so let me just flip back for a second. The prefix, prefixes tell you what data collection we're talking about. So clinical trials, you have CT, colon, and then a collection. So that means that this term is defined in the, C, in the uh, linked CT uh, uh, vocabulary. So you see here that you can have one integrated query using different prefixes. So some parts of the query are gonna get data from the countries or the geo database. Some will come from uh, the disease, some will come from clinical trials. And so, so now we can do all this in an integrated way and we have, we're able to group by and uh, aggregate and so on and so forth. Okay, so now let's get to the, the meat of the matter which is that, so the vision is to try to, um, to, to model your data in this way. And then uh, the way that we do that is there are basically three pieces to this. You have classes or concepts. So this is a simple example on the left. You have classes like a protein, that's a class. So that's a urinary relation, like you have members. You have also molecule, that's also a class. Then you have links. Links are binary relations, right? So they link two things. And here we have, in this picture, we have two types of binary relations as of right now. Uh, so first one is a type. So this is really establishing membership. So if I say X type A, that just means that um, X is a member of A, right? Uh, class A, right? And then um, we have subclass of, and it's what you think it is, a subclass of B, and it means for all X, if a, X is in A, then it's also in B. So that's what we, these are obvious. Now, why am I taking time to explain that? Is that all of these, um, these edge types and node types will have rules of inference. These, these are the very obvious rules of inference for the particular types, uh, edge types that we've, def that we've defined. And um, we've, uh, this, the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium has some standard uh, rules of, um, of uh, axioms of inference for some, basically they provide some primitives. So these are primitives, being able to say that something is a class subclass of, it's a standard primitive, it already has this axiom of inference. So reasoners already know about this and can, um, and will be able to interpret that statement that these edges very straight. So same, same with this. And these prefixes uh, sort of uh, give you the namespace where these are defined. So, um, so th there are these, and then we'll talk about how you add your own uh, uh, domain uh, relationships. But let's start with the, with the primitive ones upon which we build. So, okay, so given these two now, we have in this same picture, we have a fact which says that X is uh, Q1665 is a type of protein. So that means the member of the protein class. And then we also have that protein is a subclass of molecule. And this, so given these two statements, 
and these these rules of axioms that we know about these um these properties that were, that's what uh, they are called uh, the binary relations. We can then infer that in fact Q16665 is a type of is a molecule, right? We can compose all these together and make some and, and, and infer something that's not really specifically stated. Okay. So um, let, let's switch from bio to, because that sort of re, uh, um, requires some domain knowledge. So let's switch to like HR, it's easier to reason about some of the other examples. So here we have a very similar structure. We have uh, employee and managers concepts. Imagine that they have already been defined as a class. A class is already is a primitive concept. So um, that's already in the standard. So now you can say something is a class and then you build from there, right? So here's where your application layer starts. So uh, you have two classes you define as um, two uh, concepts you define as classes. Then you can start to link the classes, just like we did in the other one. You can say manager is a subclass of employee, and then you can say something, some individual is a type of manager, and because of that, we can then infer that this person is a type of employee. So this is very similar to the other example. But what is interesting is that the standard provides many, many primitives. These are the very, very basic ones. I can define create classes. In and say a lot more about classes. I can say, for example, that there's a class male and female, and that these two classes are disjoint, right? So that means I cannot, I should not be able to find a, a model in which there's somebody who's both male and female, right? So the, I can say that they're disjoint. I can create a new class with an expression that says a mother. So this is a class mother. I can say that a mother is the intersection of two classes, uh, a class of females and a class of things that have children. So this imagine that there's some expression about have children. Well, we can get to how we can, how we might do, do that later. So, so, you know, using these primitives, and like I said, there are many, many, and each of these primitives have their formal uh, axioms for in, in, uh, reasoning. Like in this case, it says that no element can both be here and here. So that's what disjointness means. means. So we use these and we can define what are the, the characteristics of our concepts and our, our relationships. Now, Let's get to, um, so we've talked so far about classes. Let's talk about the relationships uh, because that's a lot, a lot of where the richness starts to come in. So when we think about relationships, we're thinking about the labeled edges, how we go from, you know, what, how, we, how are two things related or two types of things related? So let's say we want to define the relationships of supervisors, right? We want that to be an arc that's possible. Now, the way to define that is, first of all, we'll say it's a binary relationship, which means it's a property. That's one thing. But then we can define what can be on its left and what can be on its right, right? What types of entities can be on its left and what types of entities can be on its right? We call the types of entities on the left the domain and the types of entities on the right the range. So basically what kinds of things can supervise what types of things, right? So here we have uh, supervisors. We can say that its domain is the class manager. And by the way, you can have multiple classes. I can have multiple classes in my domain. So, so that's one, one, one way. So this is one statement that is refining the original statement about supervisors, just calling it a property. Like again, you can say, uh, you know, you can talk about left and right and we'll see some more things we can say. So after you define this, then you can say, okay, person X, I mean, person 85 supervises person 173. And immediately what that means, if, because domain is also a primitive that has its axiom of inference based on, you know, what I just explained, then it means that the, since this is in the domain, then it means that person 085 is a man. And so even if that's not stated, we can infer this, okay? Now let's look at uh, one more thing, uh, one more example of something we can say about re uh, um, relationships. There are many things you can say. You can say relationship is transitive, you know, and so on, or symmetric and so on and so forth. You can say many things. Uh, this is an interesting one. This one says, that it, it, the supervisor's um, relationship or property is inverse functional. So typically a function means that you have a unique sort of image, but in this case, it's saying that the uniqueness is also the other way around. So that means that if I have two, two, um, two uh, statements, one says person 85 supervises 173, and person 632 supervises the same person, then these two people have to be the same, right? And this happens, this could happen because maybe data sets are coming from, you have two different databases where they're labeled differently or whatever, two different websites, it doesn't matter. So this allows us to know that, you know, in this case, even though they have different labels, they must be the same person. 
Another good example I like to use about inverse functional is mother, right? If I see two databases where it says X is a mother of Y, and then A is a mother of Y, obviously there's only one possible mother for a person. So A and Y must be the same person, right? So that kind of thing. Now you may say, okay, why does all this matter in for analytics? Well, it turns out that if we don't do this, then um, when you're aggregating data and trying to do your, your, you know, trying to do your aggregate, you may either overcount or undercount. For some of the other, for the for the first two examples, um, we had things that we inferred that were not explicitly stated. So if I wanted to say find all our employees or count all employees or count all managers. We wouldn't count those people because they're not explicitly represented in the, those facts are not explicitly represented in the data. We had to infer them. I'll say, on the other hand, for this one, where we found two different people, or what seemed like two different people, if we weren't able to say that, oh, by the way, they are the same people, then we would overcount. We would count them as two different people. Okay, so it does have an impact in, 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 in analytics. Okay, so now we've, I think, laid the ground, uh, ground, um, groundwork for um, the rest of the, uh, the, um, the talk, which is assuming you have these models. So hopefully we at least, we, we, might, be, we might be agreed on the fact that uh, semantics does add something, does add some value to analytics. So now if we have these semantic models with these axioms of ref inference, how do we, how do we make this kind of inferencing and computing efficient? And that's really been the business of what I've been working on for a few years. And so um, there are a couple of techniques. Uh, you know, if you typically, and if you want to do rule-based reasoning, you can do uh, forward chaining. So basically, you take your model and you you materialize. You basically do all the reasoning to materialize everything that's implicitly represented, and that way you don't have to deal with it anymore. Then you can just uh, manipulate your data as usual. Um, the problem with that is that can take quite some time. I've seen models where it took several days and if you change your data even a little bit, one if you add one more to, um, fact, you have to recompute the whole thing because there are no techniques really for isolating exactly which part of the closure uh, is is been affected. Uh, the other thing which is really a problem is that um, it's it blows up your your data by orders of magnitude. So you mature you, you know by materializing all these these extra facts, you go from a big data problem problem to a very very big data problem. Um, so back to chaining tends to be different. It works directly from a goal or query, from a query where it doesn't try to materialize everything. It truly materializes what it needs, what you need at a, for a particular goal, uh, a goal or query. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit, it's very much a sequential um, sort of process, depth per search type thing, if you want to think about it that way, um, or something close to that. It's very, fairly iterative. So it's hard to parallelize. Um, the newer techniques, uh, which is sort of where we've been, have said, okay, let's move away from this rule-based reason. Let's, let's try to formulate this as a database problem. Uh, because one thing databases are, are good at is we, we already have a, lo a lot of work and a lot of understanding about how to make things efficient. That's one thing database community knows how to do. So if we can take these, um, these queries and or these uh, uh, tasks and reformulate them in a way that they become first dollar logic formulae, then then, then that really falls into the purview of relational databases, for example, and, and then we'll talk about um, other kinds of databases. So, so theoretically, that's fine, except that in practice, when we do this reformulation or rewriting, the resulting FOA formula or you know, conjunctive query, whatever you want to call it, um, is there's actually conjunctive, but anyway, they, they uh, they're so very complex, and you know, database uh, query processors rely on optimizations, optimization strategies that are, a lot of them are heuristic in, in nature. So, um, and they're heuristics that make assumptions. For example, you know, relational, uh, when you're trying to do um, join ordering, if you have a query, like in your SQL query, you have uh, the, the join ordering, um, well, you know, the, the assumption, the, the algorithms assume that you're not going to have any more than maybe 10 joins, you know, per query, which, in a relational database, that's a reasonable assumption. However, in this case, it's not at all the same. So if you try to just reuse traditional databases for this kind of workload, then it fails miserably, and that's the problem. So uh, let, let's say how this actually works, like this rewriting business. 
So you have an input pattern that you're interested in. If you go back to the example that we talked about, this was about the um, trying to find people who have AIDS or TB within a particular area or whatever, that's the pattern, right? And so we now need to figure out, so that, let's call that a pattern queue. So those, we want to find such people and then we can group them by country or whatever the, the grouping and the aggregation was. So we, we, we're gonna to refer to the first part of it as the pattern, but we, uh, we're going to rewrite that into different patterns, right? Uh, so what do I mean? So if you remember the example that we've been looking at with the employee, so people could either be explicitly stated to be an employee or could be, or could be stated to be a subclass of employees, so they could be a manager. So there are different ways that we can conclude about being an employee. And that's what we mean by these different alternatives. We'll start with the exact explicit ones and then we have all the other ways. And all the other ways, all the other possibilities we derive using inferencing axioms. How, do we, how, can, we, how can we determine other um, equivalent queries that are implicitly represented? So you end up with a union of queries. So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and so on, right? And the complete answer will be uh, the, the union of all the answers. Right? So we call these a union of conjunctive queries or union of patterns, if you want to call it that. And so, so to talk about why this is a bit of a challenge, um, uh, before I talk about that, let me just quickly uh, tell you uh, the relationship between a query a graph, uh, the query and a relational database. So we've been looking at things like the triples, like we saw something, manager, whatever, you know, we, they, we call them triples generally. We've also I've maybe alluded or I've sort of alluded to the relationship correspondence between these triples and edges in the graph. So basically, this is a node edge node. That's pretty much what we've been seeing so far. And you could also think of the triples as being a tuple, a three tuple in a relational table, right? So here, exactly, you can have exactly three, three columns in the table. But because we're trying to do this using relational processing as opposed to graph, graph navigation, graph traversals, which don't really scale very well. Um, uh, we're going to now talk about how algebra um, relational um, processing would work in such a case. So let's say we have a, a, and I don't want to go into the syntax of all this, but let's say we have a pattern, very much like the big query that I showed you and I said not to worry about the syntax. We have something that describes the, the structure that we want people, who are taking courses or people who have HIV or whatever it is, we have some structure. And um, the structure, uh, basically what it does is it describes each aspect of the pattern. We want somebody who's of type student, they're taking courses, they have email addresses, so on and so forth, right? And then we want to link them by making sure it's the same entity. So we wanna make sure that it's the same, let's say student. So they must, uh, question mark S means it's variable. So when we find a binding for the first one, it must agree with the binding for the second one and so on. So how, is, how does this work? You start up, you find the matches for the first uh, pattern, you find the matches for the second one, you join them, you, this is relational join, so here, most of you probably done relational algebra, and then you join it with the next one and so on, right? So the, the point here is that even for this very small structure, you need two joins, okay? So going back to, um, Going back to this whole business of, of taking a, a one query and expanding it into many other queries, right? Q1, Q2, Q3, this is sort of what it looks like. You have, uh, let's say you want to find all students who've taken some course title with a, a, a title database. Okay, first you have to find all the ways that you can do, figure out who a student is. They're a student, they're a grad student, they have, they have an advisor, which means they're a student. And so there are also all sorts of different ways that you could figure out students. Students have taken something, and then that something has to be of type course, and then uh, and there are all the different ways you can figure out something is a course. And so now you have all the different ways, and then you combine them or you join them, you draw all the different combinations to find the total number of patterns that you have to uh, you have to search for. And the answer is a union of all these. So one of the challenges, the challenges are that this union, the example I have here had just a few branches, but in some real life like uh, biomedical uh, context you can be talking about thousands of bo those boxes where each box itself is a pattern that has a couple of joins or several joins actually, maybe 10. So you're talking about 10 times 100. I mean, sometimes you're talking about a query that altogether has thousands of joins and unions. And that's why I talked about the assumption that relational um, 
hair optimizers make, they don't, they don't, they're not designed for that kind of um, workload. And so what you will find is that many of the biomedical data sets that try to use semantic models, you can't really do ad hoc queries over them if you go online to the endpoints. They have canned queries, you know, qu queries that they have already, you know, sort of pre-computed the answers. And then if you click on this, it doesn't work fine. But if you try anything else, they, the, the system just, everything crashes. So, so um, the other thing that you have to think about uh, when we start doing this is, obviously we're dealing with large data. So we have to be talking about distributed processing. And typically for scale out, you're looking at a shared nothing um, architect. Now, in a shared nothing architecture, the only kind of parallelism that you're typically offered is partition parallelism. So what does that mean? That means that you have at each, uh, each, at each point, one operation is running. So you, you partition your data across all the nodes. Uh, so you have small pieces of data and then one operation is running on all of them, right? So that's partition parallelism. So single operator running, and that's what you get from platforms like Hadoop and it's derivative Spark and the rest of it. And so when you have an, a workload where up, um, tasks are like thousands of operations. So you can imagine uh, what this means. You have thousands. So, uh, you know, you partition your data, which means for each operation, you partition data and then and then the next operation you repartition. So network transfer, IO, disk IO uh, communication, this is quite expensive. So we focus on how to come up with optimization so that we can shorten workflows. And what we did was uh, we, we we said, let's look, at, let's look at how we can put a new lens on this data so that we can transform, and that's the spirit of pretty much everything that I've done in this space. Transform op these operations into new op newer operators that look a bit different, behave a bit different, but allow us to have short execution workflows. This, uh, this provided the possibility for major um, for parallelization that you couldn't do in the other case. And this is, um, one of our best papers, we got a uh, best paper award for IEEE Big Data 2017. I'm just gonna quickly run through this because um, I'm actually running behind the schedule that I set for myself. But so the whole idea is that rather than look at individual uh, triples, we're going to look at groups of triples as a first class data entity, right? So groups of triples that have the same subject. So you can think of it as all the facts associated with a particular, um, particular entity. Really, in the relational model, that would be a natural thing or maybe end up being one row or something, but this is a different model. But here, we don't want to worry about making them look like, like tables, because if we try to do this as tables, um, you know, I, I could produce a table from this. I could do, uh, you know, Cartesian product and, and come up with some, some tuples that look like this. This is somebody who has two names for some reason and an email address. We will end up with two tuples because of the two names, where most of the tuple is the same, or most of the two tuples are the same, except the names are different. So you end up with a lot of redundancy, much more space, and you have to do joins to do that. So we call this content equivalent. So that we say that this is a, uh, our, this representation, this set representation where you just represent, um, manage this, uh, the, uh, the set of triples as one, and we call it a triple group, is content equivalent. It has the same content as this, but it allows us to then work on a more concise representation um, of the data of, of the data. So now we can take this forward and we can take, let's say we had a big collection of, of, of uh, triples. We can group them to find out those that, you know, create these triple groups. And this is a very uh, not complicated uh, thing at all. It's a specialized, imagine a group by operation with group by the first column. Uh, with some additional um, processing on there. And the, on top of that, we can now look at groups that look similar. So for example, if you look at the second row, uh, these two entities, um, they have the same types of edges. Oh, by the way, these are edges. We just use the first letter, instead of putting the whole thing like name or mail or whatever, I just put the first letter of, of the edges, um, of the properties or attributes, we call it that. So anyway, if you look at these two, they have the same types of um, edges, A, M, and T. Uh, this, the, this one has only one member in this equivalence class. So basically we're inducing an equivalence relation on this. Um, if we had to do this with using a relational operation, we would use five joints for this, three joints for that, four joints for this. But here we just do a simple group by with some, um, with some processing after that, and we create this sort of equivalence class of each, uh, of, each of these types. You're actually now building a type system for the graph. So this 
uh, offered us some amazing opportunities. We could do some type aware uh, query optimization. So for each type, uh, we, could, we could think about, first of all, what's the best way to store it in a column-oriented file format? So everything from how it is stored to how we manipulate it, uh, what kind of operators we need, we're able to do it in a type-focused way, which allowed us quite some optimization. And also, we can look within it and look at some, some um, identify some potential uh, redundancies. Redundancy in the sense that I have one fact that implies another fact. Using, ontolo uh, using ontological axioms, I could derive one from the other. So no need to keep both explicitly stored. What does that do? That gives, puts your data, that gives you a smaller data uh, footprint if we eliminate the redundant one, right? But we can't just eliminate and forget it. We have to devise ways to remember what we've eliminated so that it, it's, we, we, uh, query processing is not lossy. So these are all some of the tricks that we played. So for this, what did we have to do? We had to then build an algebra on top of this data model so that we could have a query plan that was didn't have to have this many uh, joins and so on. We, we actually uh, was able to transform many of those joins and, and to the symbol group by the post-processing afterwards. Um, the other thing is that we could, we extended this idea to transforming. So going back to the, uh, you, um, you, uh, the, trans the rewriting, we have, a, we have a large union. So a union with uh, um, many branches of unions and then each box had many joins. So we've dealt with the many joins. Now to deal with the many unions, unions at binary operations, right? If you have many of them, uh, these are also quite uh, difficult to do if you set union. So what we did was, Using the same idea, I don't go into the details here, but using the same idea, we can rewrite this, what would be normally be a union set of unions to a logical or actually to a set of logical ors. And the nice thing is that rather than do this as binary, a series of binary operations, we can do all the logical ors as part of a parameter to a single filter and, uh, uh, operation. So it's like saying filter A or B or C or D, and so we've scanned, you can scan the data and while you're scanning, you're checking your, your, your disjunct and your filtering at the same time, rather than doing set union, multiple set union operations. So that's uh, one thing, uh, you know, another benefit we got from thinking this way. And the other thing was we could play some, play some uh, tricks with inverse relationships to change the structure of, the, of your data so that it looked more like what we wanted. If we didn't, we, by assuming um, the other relationship has an inverse, even if it's not explicitly stated. So if I want to say X manages Y, we know that we can say Y is managed by X, right? So the direction of the arrow could matter and may not look like the, the structure we want that suits our model. So when it doesn't, we can introduce uh, like this one, we introduce the flipped version, the inverse of the relation so that it matches the structure that we want. But we have to remember all of this, right? Because otherwise we end up with with an answer that doesn't that people don't expect. So by playing these kinds of tricks, we're able to, like I said, um, process in a way that you have much fewer operations and um, much faster. So here's a, a, uh, some comparisons with with um, our platform is called Semstorm, um, and we compared with Apache Hive. Apache Hive is the a Facebook uh, Hadoop relational processing platform, and uh, you know. It, it Hive by itself is unable to generate plans that can even um, handle this. So we had to manually, like you see a number of different Hive um, options here, we had to manually sort of generate uh, plans that, because otherwise, you know, the, 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 the expressions are quite complex and a typical optimizer can't deal with it. So we had to sort of manually do that. And what we see here is our stuff, which is blue, and the X is that, so some of the optimizations that we did for Hive managed to work okay. I mean, at least work, but some of them, are, if you went with the uh, typical hive, what the hive would generate for you, you would find an X that failed. It just simply failed, right? Or I just kept running and running and we gave up. So uh, that's what these X and the tildes actually mean. Um, so similar thing with uh, some other ex experiments. Again, SEMSTORM is on, we have two versions of SEMSTORM. We added some more um, uh, optimizations, one on, one off. And then the rest are the hives, and you can see what the differences look like. Again, we have cases where, where they fail. And this go, shows what some of these um, uh, comparison of, of, of storage overhead versus pre-processing time and so on uh, for hive versus semstorm. So let me uh, speed on to um, um, 
you know, the, the, the kinds of queries that I looked at uh, in the previous case were pattern queries where you can sort of think of them as um, uh, relational um, structures, but uh, we can have other kinds of queries where we're trying to actually discover uh, discover a structure. So in the previous case, when you have a pattern matching query, you give you describe a pattern, and then the goal is to find matches for the pattern. But in the structure discovery, you are trying to find you don't even know what the pattern is. You're trying to find a structure that might be interesting. So this is one good example. If you think about the 9/11 case, or where we're trying to say here, okay, um, given the set of passengers that are you know the next on flights in the next couple of hours, are they linked in any interesting way? What are their links? Um, and um, uh, it, it particularly linked, interesting means, do they have any financial and social relationship? And are they linked with any countries on the CIA watch list? So these are some of the things that maybe an analyst would do. And it's not a pattern query as we saw before, it's more like a a structure discovery query where you might want to find something that looks like the blue um, high um, area. I don't want to go into the, the, the uh, details of this, but the point I wanted to make here is that, again, the traditional trying to do this as a graph. So this is like finding paths or finding a sub and you know, inducing a subgraph on a given set of nodes. Those are the passengers and the CIA watch list and so on. Um, then you're trying to find how they're all connected. Uh, typically, you do this with a graph traversal algorithm, but they don't do well where you're talking about arbitrary paths. They only do well if you're talking about find me the shortest paths and so on and so forth. The problem is that with, with um, criminal enterprises, um, you know, the, the relationships are not always short. You know, they're going to go out of their way to hide the relationship. So trying to find shortest paths is not always going to be the most revealing. So to be able to, 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 be able to find arbitrary paths for diff with different kinds of conditions, again, we move to an algebraic framework. We have a path algebraic framework, which we derive from some graph theoretical work. And the goal there is not to manipulate paths, you know, sets of paths, because the number of paths could be exponential, but to use what, are, what we call path aggregates to represent paths. So for example, this, this here is an, is an expression that represents uh, paths. You don't have the graph here, but imagine that this represents graph uh, paths from, one, uh, from node one to five in a graph. So there are multiple paths here, but it's represented uh, concisely. It could be represented this way. And then we want to find, we want to, given this, find paths from one to five, but only those that do not contain E. So basically, we want to go from this structure to something like this, re remove all the sub uh, expressions that because they contain E. And, uh, but we don't want to do it from string, the string representation. That would not be feasible. There are other representations. One is using something like an abstract syntax tree like below, but we move from there. To, uh, from the abstract syntax tree to a binary encoding, which allowed us then do this using bit sig signature comparison. So again, just moving from a traditional algorithm uh, um, uh, formulation to another formulation where we are able to then do this. And this is the comparison. Uh, purple here is the commercial graph engine Neo4j and um, the green and red are, 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 are uh, implementations and are with our optimizations using the, the path aggregation model. So uh, let me finally finish with um, um, sort of some of the stuff that we're doing on blockchains. You know, a lot of people might wonder what, what has blockchains got to do with semantics. So blockchains, we know, uh, uh, you know, decentral, uh, decentralized ledgers uh, that often represent records uh, which are organized into blocks and, uh, you know, records of transactions. And the records are linked in such a way that, you know, if I alter one, then I have to alter all the other ones, you know because the hash of one is included in the hash of the next and so on, right? So that's what really gives it this immutable uh, um, property. So, so the, uh, I don't, there are many things that go in, uh, there are many issues with respect to blockchains. How do we decide which transactions are valid and put, to be able to put in the block and so on? That, those are not the things I'm going to talk about now. What I want to talk about has to do with the data itself, the data on blockchains. So when we look at the currency data, it's not very rich, not a lot of metadata. You only have things like the value, okay, or maybe the, what the currency is. But the, if once we now move from using blockchains to managing other kinds of assets that are not currencies, like maybe property, right, then there's much more metadata around those kinds of assets, right? And that's where, uh, how, you know, the, this data, metadata, and then semantics then starts to come in. The other thing also um, is that typically the way this is done now, is that um, you know? So the 
your um, assets is sort of a first class thing and then the, the, you have the notion of a, a transfer of assets is the first class transactional operation that is recognized by uh, all blockchains. Anything outside of that, you have to sort of code as arbitrary code in, code in what are called smart contracts, which are code that humans just write and are run ex, uh, automatically when conditions are met. And um, here's just an example, a smart contract. So again, the actual transfer of assets is a transfer transaction, which is a first class transaction. Anything else is sort of coded in this way. And here's an auction smart contract. It has a bunch of um, methods like a bid, withdrawing bid, and so on and so forth, just like you would expect. Um, and so this is what a smart contract looks like. The problem is that these are human implemented, so they're error prone, um, because you cannot, uh, just like a blockchain, uh, once they're deployed, uh, to the blockchain, you cannot change them. So if there's an error, there's nothing you can do. And uh, this has, uh, there have been some attacks, you know, where people identify vulnerabilities in a smart contract and, and you know, cost money. If somebody just drains a five, $50 million out of your co contract and, and there's nothing you can do because you cannot stop it, you cannot uh, change it. And so, so that's, that's fairly risky. And, but then it also lacks desirable properties like reuse and extensibility. These are things that we like as data people. Um, because if, if you know, you, I showed you one smart contract for an auction. If if you wanted to write, if you wanted an auction, you'd have to implement your own to capture its own behavior and blah blah blah. And all the data are, are that you're keeping track of as part of your your smart contract, you would have to have as variables in your code and so on and so forth. So the the system itself, the blockchain itself, doesn't know anything about this other than that you just have some byte code that's running, it doesn't understand the data or the behavior of your, um, uh, of your smart contract. So it's not amenable to any kind of automated, automated reasoning. So here's an example of why you might want to do this, um, uh, automate the reasoning, and I, I think I have just one or two more slides. Um, if you think about the manufacturing supply chain um, scenario, uh, which if you're, let's say, in fact, this happened with COVID, uh, with people were looking for manufacturers of PPE, right? Can who can make us? There was no PPE. There wasn't. There wasn't enough. Um, so people manufacturing as a marketplace where you're trying to match manufacturing requests to suppliers based on the supplier capabilities. The, the challenge is that um, it's this. This has um, describing such a request is quite the amount of the metadata is quite variable and quite rich, right? And I describe the data just in terms of. The product itself, I can say I want mass production of a plastic toy in a transparent wrapper. And this would imply I want someone with a CNC machine and some thermoforming processing. Uh, or I could say I want uh, ambulatory bags, blah, blah, blah. These are some other um, products. Or I could describe a particular process. I could say I want cheap, cheap metal fabrication. So the, the, the amount of metadata, they, how what you describe could be very variable. And how you then match that to the capabilities becomes requires semantics you, because you're not going to be able to do just textual matching and so on. And then on top of that, because of this variability, how do you encode that in this kind of structure where you have fixed parameters? So that means that everybody has to write one where they say what the exact parameters are and what their variables are and so on. Because once you define these parameters, uh, or these functions with whatever the parameters, you cannot change it. So there's no, if you want to create a marketplace where different suppliers can come and put their own requirements and go, then you cannot using this model. So, and my last slide here is a smart chain DB project is building a, a blockchain platform where we have different kinds of uh, uh, first class transaction primitives for marketplaces with predefined behavior. And this would allow alternative, uh, alternatives to hand curated smart contracts, at least for those primitives. And then we're able to then um, use semantics enabled data and transaction model because it's a different model, it's not a function, it's not a procedural language model, it's a data driven uh, data model for transactions. And then um, we're able to then use semantics reasoning. And so just like we've described before. So we're building this, we basically started, we're starting on top of a, an existing open source blockchain platform called BigJaneDB. And then we're extending it to add um, all these other functionalities. So um, this is an NSF funded project and I have my collaborators who are in industrial and systems engineering manufacturing folks, and then my colleague in cryptography. So that's sort of uh, a whirlwind of sort of some of the things, uh, the ways that we have approached some of these problems. I thank you. And I think we have uh, about maybe six.
six, seven minutes for questions. Thank you, Dr. Anyanvu, for your interesting talk.